And so we wanted to have this conversation today to talk through um, uh, the, the mecha mechanisms that people are using and that people would suggest others to use on how um, to communicate effectively with communities. All right, thanks, Renee. Um, so this this um, meeting today is a little different maybe than some past um, IARPIC meetings. We don't have any presentations planned. Um, it's more discussion-based, and we just wanted to listen and learn to, from folks that have joined the call. Um, but maybe what we'll start out with is the post um, that Meredith can show on her screen that we put together back in May um, that sort of kicked off this um, this request for information about um, the places that people go to look for uh, what I call the Arctic knowledge information maps. Um, and this really came from uh, our understanding that uh, researchers need to share more about the activities that they're doing um, around the Arctic, um, particularly near and in communities, um, and that uh, folks in communities want to know what's happening and why that research is important and where the findings are going to go. Um, but also, we want to we recognize that communities want to drive their own research and have their own information systems, um, and that they may often want to know sort of what is being done in their region to inform their own information um, and monitoring or uh, methods that they want to pursue um, on their own. And so, the general request was sort of where do people go for information, um, and are there sites that are used regularly by people? Are those helpful? Are they informative? Um, and ultimately, you know, does there need to be something new or different or better um, that can more effectively provide information to communities um, around the Arctic? Um, and so in this post from, from May 9th that we put together, um, Meredith, maybe you can just scroll down and show the number of comments that we received from this post. And you're, uh, people are able to go into IRPIC and look at these. But there's a long list of different sites and um, projects and science platforms and other kinds of platforms that people are using to disseminate information and share information. Um, and there's a lot of them. And if there are others that we're not aware of, we'd appreciate you posting it here so that we have a better list. Um, and so again, I think even after all these posts, I think we still come back to the question of, of are any of these being used by communities? Are they effective? Um, and so that's kind of how we wanted to kick off the discussion. So. Um, I guess I'll leave it at that for now, but Renee, if you want to say anything else, and then um, maybe we could go back to the questions on your page, Meredith, um, that we sort of wanted to, to try to address today. So Renee, I don't know if you want to add anything to that introduction. Yeah, that was great, and I'm glad that you highlighted the different um, results that came out of that query. And I think it's a useful resource, and maybe we can even put all of the things that we collected um, into a, a document or another way to distribute all that information. Um, and I think that when we're talking today, we have the opportunity to throw out some new ideas um, about a, a new mechanism that might be useful or how we can piggyback on existing mechanisms. And so we want to hear all kinds of ideas of um, where people go to get their information and how we can better disseminate information where people will find it especially people who are in communities. So I think we could go back to the questions and start the conversation with that. So, um, yeah, so we could start with the first question. And this first question, I, I want to just recognize that I'm sensitive to what we're, what we're asking here, which is sort of where do communities go for information um, and, and if they do go someplace where they find information, could this be a place where researchers could post information from the work that we're doing? But I'm very sensitive to the fact that these might be, you know, highly trusted resources within communities and that this is not the place for us to be posting information. So I just want to recognize at the start as we have this discussion that, um, that we're not proposing that we, that we suddenly you know, have a massive influx of research information or other other information to, to sort of trusted community sites. Um, but if these are open, that this might be a place for us to share or or this might lead to a discussion of, of that we need a different sort of site where we could post information and have that as a reference for a community. So I'll just leave it at that. And if anyone would like to, to chime in 
or propose their own introduction to this, this kind of topic, we'd really appreciate it. Um, this is Diane Hirschberg from ICER, and I, I put a comment in the chat that I think it's really important that we define what we mean by communities because there are multiple ways to look at communities. I mean, if you're talking specifically local community, local residential places in the Arctic, you know, or local um, collections of people who live in the Arctic, it's very different in terms of thinking both about how we make things available and their access. You know, if I think about my students out the uh, Aleutian chain who miss class because volcanoes are going off um, versus, you know, if we're talking about communities, including our policymakers locally, our policymakers nationally, our collaborators who are located in other communities across the Arctic. Um, and so I think it's, it's, we really need to be a little more nuanced um, because I think that's one of the frustrations is the way I would try to get information to policymakers is not the same way that I would try to get information to collaborators in Kotzebue. This is Thanks so much, Diane. That's a great comment. This is Gay Sheffield. So I, I joined uh, just as you were opening this up, asking the first question. So I'm sorry I missed the preamble. So forgive me if my question is. Uh, not appropriate, but um, when you're using social media sites, um, I think the, the speaker just we had we had a good question about audience. My question is, what would be the objective? When you say science information about a region could be posted, what is the what's the objective so you would know what success looks like? Um, so thanks, Gay and Diane as well. So first of all, can I just tackle Diane's question or answer that? Um, oh yeah, sorry. I think for the point of what's that? Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. So just in terms of Diane's question, I, I think the target here is local communities. Um, I think that we are really trying to provide information to communities where researchers are working, and it, it could end up being something else as well in terms of a, a more of a two-way street or multiple-way street for for indigenous knowledge to be posted to for a region so that we're all aware of that, um, however that may take place. And it, it, it could be many different things, but I think it's definitely um, at the local community scale that we're trying to figure out um, if something exists or if we might want to, you know, help to build something that's more effective um, or different. Um, and then I think, Gay, from your point of view, from a, what's, what's a success, I think that we are trying to find a place where we can post information that, that communities can use if they're wanting to do something new, um, if they're just wanting to be informed about what's taking place, um, if they meet a researcher in their community, or if they meet an indigenous knowledge holder that's working on a project in their community, that that, that person can say, yes, this information is here um, if you want to learn more. Um, so, I mean, it, that's still a very big spectrum and a very big circle that I'm drawing um, around what we could do, but we could start small and then see where to go from there. So I guess, and I, I know there's lots of other speakers, so please speak up, but you're, you're under where do communities go for information? That is what the, the title of the three bulleted paragraph is, right? So I guess my question is, speaking as someone who lives in rural Alaska, um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm only speaking for the Bering Strait region, very s relatively small area. Do you know where communities go for information? Do, is that a question that regionally that the larger, I would guess, or we're talking urban based science community understands? I, I mean, I think that is a really good question. Yeah, okay. so that is one of the main questions that we're right. here. So, so there are big regional differences yeah. in, in communications. And I guess I would, I would say, again, as a resident, that we find we have our very own regional communication networks. You know, we, we have very unusual logistics out here. We have very unusual um, broadband issues. Um, you know, the logistics of, of internet, the logistics of, of telephone and electricity, running water and whatnot. 
And we also have unusual activities that may be regionally specific that may not be something that people are comfortable sharing in other to other urban based people or people from out of state, you know, like the harvest of marine mammals, that kind of thing. And so I think I would really look at how do regions, different regions of Alaska that you're trying to target, how do they communicate? Is there a way to, we have found that when outside urban based entities integrate into the regional communication network and take advantage of that, they have much better success, sort of comprehensive success, both delivering messaging and receiving information um, than by trying to set up something that may be relatively easy for, for urban based, like chuck it all in a, in a Facebook site or something like that. Is that, that's just a comment, thank you. So Gay, I think um, my question is, um, are the networks so informal that there is really no purpose in trying to use social media or some other tool to reach some of the communities where we work? That there's really no other way than the sort of word of mouth uh, public forum, you know, local public forum kind of approach. Uh, you know, I think yeah us are under the impression that people still use Facebook and Twitter and possibly Instagram and others where they get information. So that, that is, is that is true. Those consumers. That is true. And there are, I would say you're absolutely right. But again, my question would be, what is your objective? Is your objective to, because it sounds like you want to take a lot of information from different sciences and push them into one location. That is, maybe easy for all the science world but how would you sort that out in a website how would you yeah and so so That's it becomes cool. too big too glossy for the band, broadband even even something like a research cruise that is like the healy or or any of the unals people they're doing a great job and i'm not knocking what people are doing i'm just saying that if you're a specific cruise and you're putting out a big blog um, you're putting out a m bunch of photos, you're kind of a random ship. And, and here in the Bering Strait region, we have many, many concurrent research vessels all trying to do that, um, either for their own funding agency or for the vessel itself, um, or for a, multiple projects within a one research vessel, right? The university, you know, all these different universities represented in a vessel. And what maybe our biggest concern might be in the immediate is where is the vessel? That kind of thing. So there's, there's a, what is the, the, um, the objective when you're putting out your, your information and how do you know when you've reached success? Those would be two things I would sort of at, bring it back to, but uh, as the woman who was asking about who's your audience, I think that's the same kind of question I'm, I'm coming at. If that's helpful, I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying it's a tremendous, you know, yeah, so Gay, I don't think that we are seeking a singular mechanism. I think what we're asking is for different areas, for different tribes, um, and for different types of science, even. What are the pos all the, you know, the universe of possibilities, and how do we kind of map our efforts to those things? We're not trying to look for one Facebook page to rule them all or something like that. Okay. No, it's understood for different areas what are the useful um, mechanisms and how would we better utilize those better participate in that forum and share information people want and if, if what people want are locations of where a vessel is or where a research project is great if if what people want are results so i think we're we're, we're actively asking what do people want to hear and how do they want to hear it and understanding the um, you know, that there's a whole mosaic of answers to those questions. So, Renee, there's been a number of studies that have been done in the past about what people's concerns are. Um, are those ever gone through and, and, and sort of um, some, some bulleted information to resulting from those that might help 
the research community know what people are looking for or what their concerns are that would be one thing um, because there have been a lot of work done in the past i think on just those issues what do people want what's the best way to deliver it um, the re i'll go back to the regional communication networks for for a region like the Bering Strait region, we have a lot of organizations that have multiple, you know, the same communities may be represented. So things like the co-management groups, um, but they are not explicit. They don't cover all communities in the Bering Strait region, right? They're not a one-stop shopping. However, they are for certain types of science. They are very good. We also have tribal consortium we have Sea Grant, we have the regular UAF Community College, we've got the tribal offices. Um, we have the Norton Sound Regional Health Corporation, just physically in our region. Um, and those are really some, some of the ways we have a CDQ, uh, uh, the Norton Sound Economic Development Corporation, that's our CDQ group. Um, they deal with a lot of fisheries and development and other. So looking at it, what does a region have? What do they use as their regional communication network? Because we're all wearing multiple hats in the coast. And I think that would, I think that might get at regionally, um, that might be helpful. And it would take some legwork to understand how regions talk both amongst themselves and also to other regions, right? Oftentimes when we have a difficulty, we're not looking to Anchorage, we're looking north and south along our coast because we don't have to explain the importance of subsistence. We don't have to explain what a, what a bearded seal is, you know, those kind of things. So I think if it, there could be really very good and probably interesting on study or information on how rural Alaska really does communicate and it might help answer where do communities go for information? And I, I know I'm taking up too much airway, so go ahead. We have exa a lot of examples of where people have tried, um, but it's usually more comprehensive and efficient if you're going within a region, regional entities. Thank you, Gay. And I, I appreciate those comments, and I, I want to make sure that we have an opportunity for other people to also speak up about other things they've tried or um, other regions as well. Oh, well, this is Diane again. I, I, I had put a comment about public radio. You know, again, I, and I think Gay's um, point about what is the, why, why are we doing it? What is the purpose? Um, really speaks to then the kind of media we use for the uh, for what we're trying to do when we were doing research on boarding school experiences. So I'm a social scientist. Um, uh, we were using public radio. We were using stuffing bags at AFN. We were using, you know, a lot more, um, uh, a lot more personal and interpersonal ways of communicating um, to, to reach out to people as opposed to, websites because the people we were trying to reach were probably not going to look at a website um and this was before everybody had facebook um across the state we're right now you know as the ua system um struggles with our our current uh fiscal and structural debates um there's a lot of people that are using uh facebook chat um, much more actively than I've ever seen before. And so, you know, perhaps the death of Facebook has been um, reported in error in terms of this communication. And I really appreciate what Gay said is it's going to be different in different communities because again, when, when you have places that don't have um, good bandwidth, but might have gotten better cell access, then it's, it's a text network. It's, um, it's people that have apps that they can use with their phone. Thanks, Diane. Um, this is John again. I just posted in the chat um, for Melissa Heflin. She posted a comment, and I was just wondering, Melissa, if you could let us know about your region um, in relation to the chat comment that you posted. 
Uh, good morning. This is Melissa Heflin with uh, Bering Sea Elders Group. I'm actually based out of uh, Anchorage, Alaska, but I work with uh, coastal communities from Wells, Little Diomede area, all the way down to Platinum. And one of the, you know, in, in regards to research, um, you know, as far as the question that I had is, how many, you know, they're, they're just, just my observation, there seems to be a lot of um, scholarly individuals on, the, on, the, on this call right now, is how many indigenous rural participants, you know, as Gay had mentioned, um, that, that like from, from my perspective, it seems to be significantly lacking. So on this call, how many are indigenous rural participants that actually live um, rely on, you know, the ocean and the land as their food sources, um, you know, and ways to include research. And then if there are any, you know, folks on this call, um, have you had the opportunity to share with researchers your perspectives and they have they actually been taken, you know, into full consideration? Um, just working with the elders um, for my organization, you know, I, I was just making a random phone call to one of my my other reps and he said, did you know that two young men went up like, you know, X amount of miles up, up the coast from Kotlik and found so many, you know, uh, deceased marine mammals. And so, you know, I had sparked an email to um, the point of contacts that I have at Kawarik, um, you know, and it just kind of like, that's, that's an example of communication. I was just checking on my elder, you know, and mm -hmm. it's with me. So it's, it's, it is still very much so word of mouth perspective. Um, and as far as Facebook, maybe for the lower 48 and, and, you know, other parts of the world, Facebook does not, necessarily you know work for for those folks but for Alaska like um in in the folks that I interact with that's how we find out you know ice conditions hunting um berry picking greens you know if there's weird animals coming about um or even if there's researchers in the region like you know go to the tribal council because they're gonna you know the airplane just came you know stuff like that um so you know that that's one of the the questions that i have because i um it would be i think most insightful if if we had the other perspective going on where there were only a handful of researchers on this call and majority of the participants were those actually living working reside you know um relying on the the sea and the land um so that's all i have to share for right now thank you hi guys uh this is corey sequel erickson with uic science and thank you melissa hi renee hi john diane gay everybody good to hear you guys i i didn't really prepare for this but uh i do wanted to kind of piggyback on um Melissa's comment and, and as well as some of the other uh, subject matter here. Uh, I think to reach all the different cohorts in the communities, I think definitely you're going to have to have a uh, menu of options. I mean, I think what it def I think social media is one area that we really got to um, get better at. And looking at even just that first question you have, where do communities go for information? If you ask if you even like if you flip it around, like what Melissa said, like. Um, People in the villages. What do you what do you call your scientific information? People just also have a ton of information, you know. And we all talk about social knowledge and all that, but you know, science is based on observations. These guys in the villages, they that's all they do, twenty four seven. You know, just hunting, making observations. So they're going to have a lot of feedback. They're going to have a lot of questions. They're going to have a lot of answers, and they're going to want to share that. So. The old idea that we're going to come and dump this information on the communities and, you know, we're going to make it available to the public that 
really going to have to be a two-way two -way thing. And, it, and having said that, it's going to take a ton of energy and a ton of time to actually do this right. I think, um, I think if you had a, many of options, say an email and a listserv, that's going to access uh, some, some, of the, some of the cohorts that don't, for instance, have Facebook or maybe don't listen to the radio. Maybe if you had three options, uh, uh, an email listserv, one, two, a radio show, that'll, that'll get to the cohorts that might be out at, say, fish camp that don't have internet. Um, and then a third social media, I think social media, like Melissa said, is our way of, of communicating things. It's really changing how we can communicate across villages and across the state. Um, with having said that, it's going to be a two way communication thing where you're going to have to have someone who's, you know, on the ball, who knows about that inside information, kind of what I was talking about, who knows about the local entities, the local lingo, and are able to answer to these daily questions inquiries and you know and then and also take in these observations because when we do these big outreach events we can't have the community sit down and have the scientists you know tell them their results what they think and what they found that we're trying to move past that era and and what we do now is we try to give everybody the same amount of time to reflect and like even in the Utkusuk meeting for instance we had a few weeks ago it was worked out perfectly because we were able to let the community share their observations the scientists were able to kind of correlate what they've seen about, you know, higher vegetation growth and all that kind of thing. So that the community really felt like they were, you know, it was more of a two way communication, but then they were also able to share all these things and it. It, it wasn't, uh, that's what it's going to take here. If you want to share information is uh, the social media, it's going to take a lot of energy. It's going to take a lot of time. It has to be two way eye to eye. Um, kind of a communication. And then the, I guess the last thing that I'll say is to go back to what I started with is that what you call information and use, even in that first question, we have a ton, people have a ton of information out there that they feel that they need to share, that they want to ask questions about it. They want to give their feedback about it. So it's, it's going to be a total two way thing. And um, that's going to take a lot of resources to do it. Right. I think. I appreciate those suggestions. Thank you. And I think, um, like you said, sort of targeting maybe at least three different types of communication. Um, and I like the idea of, of distributing information ahead of a public meeting so that people have had a, a chance to think about it and come in with questions versus hearing it cold in the meeting. I think that's a good approach that we might want to um, do more do more. John, are there some more questions we should um, make sure that we get through? And, and I guess another question is we, we talk about social media kind of in general terms, but I think if there are specific places people go, um, specific feeds or pages, I think that level of specificity is also helpful. Um, it's very challenging for an academic or a federal agency to get information out on uh, you know, a tribal website where people actually go to that tribal website. So I think that's kind of the, the roadblock to using them is you have to have people following your, the feed that you're putting your information on. And so, it may, so social media is a little bit limited for that. Renee. This is Gay. I just want to make a comment. Is there, is this a reflection, you know, having, talking about the social media site, is this sort of, right now we have large gaps at times between rural and urban based, um, because a lot of the urban based agencies and researchers are in the urban, or in the hubs. Um, the, um, you know, regionally, there's such differences between a place like Bristol Bay or a place like Eastern Beaufort Sea. Is this sort of precluding or is there no look at how well agencies are actually communicating on the everyday with their regional constituencies so that you actually, that these not, it's great to have these social media sites, but that people have a, they should be able to go if they've got seabird questions, they should be able to pick up the phone and know who the seabird biologist is for their region and, and know that they're being listened to. Is this, I almost look at this as like a, 
it's kind of getting even further away from joining people, mm -hmm. regional constituencies and the people that are doing research or management. Is that, is that a different discussion? Um, this is Meredith and I just wanted to note on that um, topic of having like a uh, kind of a directory of where people could go um, to to find information on seabirds or um, harmful algal blooms. We started doing something like that for a workshop that was in Bethel and it was just a very preliminary um, directory but the idea was having a point of contact, having an email and having um, information about what that point of contact could help with. Um, so that might be something to think about too. <clears throat> this is Gay. Having a having a, a website or a directory that directs people away from the regional communication network for certain subjects, we have found, especially in times of crisis when we have a die off of birds or marine mammals or a, an oily, leaky ship, there's a lot of support in the beginning to say, okay, reroute all calls on this subject matter to this website, this person. And then that cannot be sustained. That level of dealing with say 20 tribes just in the Bering Strait region is not sustainable. And then we, we find that there's a, a, you know, we have to reroute our communications and then they always reroute back to the regional communication network for the everyday. Um, I don't know if that's helpful, but it, it does, there is something to be said about rerouting communications if you're not really gonna be sustaining it at a high level for all communities within a region. If that's helpful, thank you. Hi, this is Allison uh, Gaylord. I spent uh, six winters living in Utkiavik and have continued to work up there since. And I just wanna remind everybody that there's also the traditional postings that, you know, at the post office, the grocery store, the heritage center, the major borough offices, where people look at these announcement boards on a regular basis. And we have found that um, that's often where we'll pick up interested parties um, for attending meetings or we'll call and, and say, oh, we saw your flyer here or your postcard. Um, so while I'm a huge fan of websites and web mapping and I think getting the information out to, you know via Facebook we've seen a lot of success with we we have we just can't forget that those traditional places or those typical stops where people go to are you know should be remembered too thank you Allison that's a good point yeah thanks Allison um, and is there anyone else from from rural communities um, or from Alaska Native communities that hasn't had a chance to speak yet? I don't know everyone's name, I apologize. John, can I say one more thing? This is Corey. Uh, yeah, please do, Corey. The thing that, that we have to, on the science side of things, I mean, with, there has to be coordination and collaboration regardless of affiliation, that's what I like to say. But like, I mean, you have one group, you know, like for instance, the UAF or somebody you know, or, or, you know, USGS or somebody you know, they're gonna have, wanna do their own thing and everyone's gonna wanna own their own information and how it's shared and how it's spoken about and people are kind of, are not gonna speak on behalf of others. So I think we can't have all these different tangents going on. There has to be some sort of coordination amongst on the federal level, on the state level, everybody who's coming into these villages because it's the villagers see all these people coming from the same kind of group and they're gonna, you know, and whereas all these groups are coming in and they're not aware of each other. And, you know, there's no way that Noah is gonna speak on behalf of some NSF project. You know, there's no way that, uh, you know, um, it's just that I think there has to be some coordination and collaboration on the federal level that are coming into our villages because if, if you want to get all this information into one spot and someone's gonna have to take responsibility because no one's gonna, you know, one entity is not going to take responsibility for another entity's work and this and that, you know, so there's so much groups that are moving at on different tangents that that's, there has to be some coordination on that side of things as well. Yeah, I totally agree, Corey, and I think that was one of the, just one of the things I was trying to look for in, in making that original post and having this meeting was to try to pull 
all the federal agencies together and, and other other groups as well into a single site. And that, that is one of the purposes of IARPIC is to bring everyone together that's working in the Arctic to share information. So if this would be a place to at least have one site where multiple people could could deposit information, um, that's just one resource that would be helpful. Um, so that's, that was one of the reasons we wanted to have this meeting was to ask that question. John, this is um, Melissa Heflin again. Um, so yeah, Mike, go ahead. just to piggyback on what Corey said is um, the other component maybe, you know, to consider when we're interacting with those on the federal level is, you know, the concept of a tribal liaison um, to have, you know, a position like that to where it's actual, you know, it's, um, it's someone who truly understands you know, rural community living. So say for instance, if I, I didn't know how to communicate very well with, with my uh, Yupik and Inupak elders, um, I'm not the best fit for my position. I have to, you know, totally understand and have lived, which I have, you know, um, to live in rural Alaska and understand, you know, there's no running water, there's no flush, toilet systems everywhere, the, the, the high cost of groceries relying and also consuming, you know, the, the different food types that you cannot find, you know, at a Cars or Fred Meyer or Costco or even on Amazon. Um, but to have someone, you know, in, in a role working, you know, in, on the federal level that truly understands uh, the the perspectives of rural Alaska and that could kind of be that bridge between you know like understanding what a community um, member is saying and then translate it to those on the federal level which you know some of them some folks on the federal level they, they just really don't have a true understanding um, you know, because their their mind is you know totally focused on something else. So that's all I wanted to include. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Melissa. Hi, this is Allison again. I, I was just thinking about um, some successful efforts that I have seen working at least up on the North Slope. It seems like the North Slope Science Initiatives annual meetings in the villages where they disperse paper maps showing where upcoming projects are happening are very well received. People want to know what's happening in their backyard. And, and I know in, in Barrow at least uh, folks are often very interested in, okay, what's what's that boat offshore? What, what is that a tanker? Is that a research vessel? Um, and, you know, we've got a website link that, you know, you can click on and find out what is offshore, but not everybody's looking at that. I, th I think that, you know, looking at those traditional, I, I don't want to say traditional, but the, uh, the radio, the flyers, maybe a marine announcement, marine report every morning, um, might be something that could be built on. Um, I know AOS has a really nice uh, weekly newsletter. I mean, that might be something that could be reformatted to be fed out through a Facebook feed as well. Um, I, I think there's some really good examples out there that we could definitely build on. That's really so, um, Thanks for that comment. I'm wondering, I think you're on mute, Renee. Oh, I was just thanking Allison for pointing, pointing out those resources and successful mechanisms. Yeah, and I, um, to be honest, I wasn't aware that NSSI did an annual meeting. So that would be, that would be of interest, I think, to a lot of people for the North Slope region. And if there are other annual meetings that take place in other regions, I think that's something we'd like to know about too. Um, that's yet another location where we could provide information and learn about what's taking place in those regions.
So I really appreciate all the comments in the chat. Um, I just want to see if there's anyone else on the call who hasn't spoken yet who would like to offer any observations or comments. Hi, this is Renee Tatusco with the National Weather Service Alaska Region Headquarters. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead, please, Renee. Um, I really like the comment that was made by, uh, and I don't re remember her name, uh, regarding the potential of utilizing uh, tribal liaisons. And um, I know that FEMA uh, has one here in Anchorage. Uh, the Weather Service has a tribal liaison team that we're trying to um, uh, enhance our outreach to the communities with regard to weather and water forecasts and warnings, including sea ice. Um, I'm sure that um, there may be tribal liaisons with other federal agencies, but I'm wondering if perhaps uh, it might be useful to identify who those tribal liaisons are and to to try and bring them all together to ensure that we all understand what each of us are trying to do so that we can help each other and the communities. So that was just my thinking. Thank you. Hi, Renee. That's a good suggestion. And, and someone did mention tribal liaisons earlier. There's actually a network of all of the federal tribal liaisons in Alaska, and they meet a couple of times a year. And this might be a topic to bring to them about helping communicate to communities. Um, so maybe we can we can have that the Alaska uh, Tribal Liaisons Network share some of their thoughts back with us um, and become more actively engaged and be a conduit for information both directly with our with the federally funded researchers. Thanks. I Mary. would support that. That's that I had no idea such a group existed. Would love to learn more myself. And then just to kind of um, piggyback on um, Gay's comment as well as Rachel's um, comment about about the existing organizations. I mean, just also to thank NSF for. I mean, my my position as North Slope Science Liaison on North Slope has been we've been able to really share a lot of research, research and kind of have one one person to kind of facilitate a lot of that, and it's been really successful. And it's it was totally funded by NSF. So thank you, NSF, for that. And it, it, I'm hoping that something like that could be replicated in other regions. But um, you know, um, I wouldn't put it all on you know NSF, obviously, because like I said, I think it's across the board. Several different funding agencies should probably maybe talk about getting together and having a liaison network, or even helping fund this tri the tribal liaison, mm -hmm. so that um, and maybe like say put position at Quark, or you know, just to throw it out there, uh, make a position at Manila, you know, you know, I mean, just ideas like that to fund. Uh, a group of liaisons that maybe meet once every two weeks have have a kind of a process that they go through um, share ideas be on the same page so that the region has a face someone that they can go to for any and all science that's happening in their backyard thank you Corey thanks Corey yeah. um, and Aaron Poe you just posted a comment similarly so could you provide comments uh, um, via the phone as well Aaron, what I was thinking. Oh, there you go. Yep. Sorry, I think I just was unmuted. Uh, yeah, so sorry, I was pounding out that text um, right as Corey was speaking, and I, I think he maybe said it better than what I was trying to say. I think it's great that these agencies have liaison type positions, but I think maybe a more mm, appropriate approach, and actually Melissa, I think, had suggested something similar, is that those positions could actually be based within tribes or tribal organizations. Um, and that might be a better conduit to getting out um, to folks. Yeah, I agree. I think that's the strength of Corey's position on the North Slope too. And, you know, replicating that is good. And I think we should be keeping that in mind as you know, part of our role of, of having this conversation and listening to the ideas is recognizing that we might have to implement something. We might have to modify how we do things or adapt or adopt things. And so we are open to hearing these ideas. So Renee, this is Gay. I, I think that it would be great to have some accountability in on the messaging that's going out and 
the impact or not that it has had. Um, you've had, and I'm, I'll just, since you're NSF, I'll just say NSF has been paying for the best outreach in education for 40 years. Um, it might be useful to know for you or for us to know what have been the forms of communication and what has been successful and what hasn't been successful. And that might be something that communities, regional hubs, everyone who's had federal scientists or federally funded scientists in their region or their neighborhood or um, might really want to be able to participate in, in voicing um, because I think that was noted here earlier to have a lot more stakeholders be able to voice up and that that might make give you some new information and new perspectives on how uh, the last 35 years of outreach and education has gone in places like rural Alaska. Thank you. Um, so Corey and Melissa, I had a follow-up question to what Aaron and Corey you were just talking about is, is do we, how many, how many, how many positions, liaison positions do we currently have in Alaska that are based in those communities and in those um, tribal organizations? I also wanted to point out that Jennifer Hooper um, from AVCP is also on the line and might be able to help. Yeah, I think well, my, my position is really unique. It's not, there's, I mean, the, the tribal liaisons, I mean, that I, I can't speak to that. I know that that's a bigger network. Um, my position was unique that just because in Barrow they needed someone to to do all that and NSF um, started, you know, they funded that position. Um, and I don't know if it's anything like that exists anywhere else. Um, but, you know, there's, there are like, it's in the Dome region, you know, gay is the person that everybody knows that anything, anything and everything, weird things are going on within the environment or if they have questions about a cruise or something, they know who to contact. And, you know, you know, there's these locals that, that are kind of, in the in that position that are funded from totally different sources and i can't speak to the tribal liaison groups but uh but you know i, I just know that there's a few unique things here and there like for instance gay's position or i position or even the department of wildlife management in barrow you know they really funnel they really are good uh, liaisons to the community and between the community and scientists so Gee whiz. Thanks, Corey. Yeah, I've been um, in, uh, oh, I'm sorry, and I'll just, just I, I meant to say one last thing was that, that, and that there's a huge lack of those positions in many parts of Alaska is what I wanted to really push home to is that a lot of those villages, they don't have anybody to go to. So that, that's why this might help out a lot, have this conversation. Hi, this is um, Carolina. I think I think these are all really, really important suggestions. Um, but uh, another part, though, that this comes back to is still that overarching need for relationship building. And so, so it it, it is really good to um, look at how to fund um, people within communities to be a point of contact. Uh, but it's also really important that. Um, as Melissa was saying, that the federal governments actually have people working for them and with them that are knowledgeable about the governance systems that are uh, at a community level or regional level. So even knowing that the North Slope Borough does have community li liaisons for every single community, but that doesn't mean that they have full capacity to communicate whatever you want them to communicate. And so maybe more funding is needed to support that. But but again, back to Melissa's point again, is um, having somebody, uh, having multiple indigenous representations within IARPIC that actually know already what are all of the regional uh, meetings happening this year, already know it's whaling right now, so it's not a good time to get a hold of people. Um, already, you know, having this understanding that people aren't working on your on the same time scale that you're working on because they have other things going on that are more important, right? And I just think all of those points really speak back to that importance of um, 
people within the federal government becoming educated and not just putting the onus back on the on the community, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, Jennifer Hooper and Bethel, did you have anything you wanted to add? I appreciate your comment in the chat box. Um, well, we have about five minutes left on our phone call. Um, I guess I'll just ask for any final comments. And Renee, I don't know if you have anything that you wanted to, to sort of end the call with. Yeah, I want to give anyone else who has comments um, or something that they wanted to contribute another chance to speak or type in the chat box. I really appreciate the interest that people have shown. Um, I think a lot of people are interested in doing better in this realm, and we've had a lot of great suggestions. Oh, Jennifer, okay. Do you have more to say? We still can't hear you. Hmm. Maybe there's an audio block there. Is it just Jennifer in the participant list? We can unmute her. Um, I, the name. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, there you are. Okay. Sorry, I, I was muted on the computer, but the phone was unmuted, so. Um, sorry, I, I was talking and just, um, wasn't being heard except by my colleague here. Um, anyways, I was just saying that um, I really agree with a lot of the discussion. The last, um, you know, several speakers mentioned um, Melissa raises really good points, and I, I really agree and, and take to heart what Carolina um, just shared with us. Um, and the comments that I provided online um, just are that, you know, the regional entities, um, you know, do have those existing relationships with their, um, you know, tribes and villages within their service areas. And, um, you know, there are definitely ways to expand on that and um, to utilize those um, relationships. But as Carolina mentioned, that doesn't mean we have the capacity to, you know, take on a lot more. And so um, um, just appreciate the, the comments related to the funding needs, but also trying to um, create a system that everyone, you know, recognizes and understands is the, the place to start, um, both from the researcher's perspective, um, but then also, you know, at the community level and developing that um, that framework and that, that two-way path, you know, moving forward. Thanks, Jennifer. Anyone else with some final thoughts before we sign off? This is Melissa. Hey, Melissa. Um, just one other comment that I have is that as far as resources and, you know, like funding, that's, that's great, but we also need to consider sustainability if we do, you know, uh, work to emphasize um, the tribal liaison positions in, within the communities, you know, like uh, one of the complexities that I deal with um, is the turnover of tribal administrators, you know, like it, it, certain dynamics going on and, you know, the concept can also go into like community health aids. Are they getting the support within their community um, in certain ways, but then also funding, you know, is it only a two year position and, you know, do they want to stay in that or, and if they do leave or, you know, they're taking their their knowledge uh, system with them. So definitely sustainability is something that we, you know, should consider moving forward. Thank you.
And uh, I guess the final thought from our neck of the woods uh, is that we've been really thinking about this and making plans uh, to how to tackle this, these problems and on the North Slope. And uh, we're, well, you guys will probably see it down the line, but I know several people on the call, they've been working really hard uh, at Arcus as well, science to try to create what we're, we're gonna call Suvut Science. And that'll be just like a social network that kind of help some of these issues on in our region and if it works for our region then we'll, we'll hopefully wanted to put just to mention that so you can look forward to that down the, down the road okay thank you thank you thank you great well thanks so much everyone um i think we're at the end of our time but i just want to let folks know that we really really appreciate your participation and all the comments um this is has just been fantastic um and we are going to sort of think about all the comments and, and maybe we'll do a follow-up phone call and um, address some of the additional questions that, that were raised um, and keep the discussion going. Um, Renee, did you want to close with anything? Yeah, I, I similarly want to thank everyone for participating. I think we um, have heard some and been reminded of some of the things that uh, work in some places and not others. And uh, I think we have some good ideas of how to coalesce some of this information so that it's useful and people can apply appropriate things where they're going. Um, and we still have more to think about in terms of um, how to develop uh, maybe more robust communication. Um, and, and Corey, you know, mentioned working together with, with our regions develop networks um, so I think you know this is something that a lot of people are interested in and want to keep pursuing and uh, developing better ways to do things so thank you everyone for participating all right well thanks so much everyone again and uh, have a great day thank you Bye. Everyone.